This is Reverend Donna Villamere, and I'm a spiritual counselor and bereavement coordinator for Kindred Hospice. We're based in Marlboro, and we're here at the Southboro Library this evening. We're going to be talking about a program, We Honor Veterans, which is a very particularly special program for us where we have a chance to not only celebrate those who served in the military and gave us and protected all these freedoms that we have, but now as they're coming to the end of their lives, we're talking about veterans World War II and beyond, where they could use some extra support. Tonight in particular, we're going to be talking about hospice veteran partnerships. How can someone who has also been a veteran, maybe the same era, maybe beyond that, also support a veteran when they come to this particular stage in their life. And I hope you can join us for this program. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this incredible presentation. I know it's a beautiful summer night, and I'm glad that you found the time to still join us. Tonight, we're going to talk about a particular program called We Honor Veterans, which is a coalition partnership between various hospices and different veterans agencies and the Hospice and Palliative Care Federation. I particularly work for Kindred Hospice in Marlboro, and that's the particular program I'll be sharing with you tonight. The main topic for tonight is we're going to talk about matching volunteer veterans with veterans who are on our service. And the purpose of that is not only showing the honor, respect, and appreciation for our veterans for all that was given to us in the past, but to be a supportive, validating comfort for these veterans when they come to the end of their life. American veterans have done absolutely everything asked of them and beyond. And what we have a chance to do now is to pay some of that back. We've embraced this ability, this mission to serve our veterans. In particular, when, company, when agencies such as Kindred Hospice have gone through the training, we're especially prepared to support the extra needs of a veteran at the end of life. Those different needs can be influenced by whether or not someone was a combat or non-combat experienced veteran. Which war did they serve in? What if they were a prisoner of war? What are the effects of PTSD? What was the branch of service, the rank? Were they enlisted, drafted? What age did all of this start for them? All of those things can play into, come into play as time goes on. Things that people probably had to put aside, lock up in their memory box, and then it comes out later on. And they may not have someone who shared that experience with them, who shared military life with them. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples to start with. Several years ago, we worked with someone who had been in the Army um, in World War II and had heard rumors of these things called concentration camps, but didn't quite know how true they were, if that was so true at all. This particular gentleman was one of the first troops to discover the reality of one of the concentration camps. He lived through that experience, did the liberation, did everything he had to do when he was there. He came home with that horror in his mind and heart. But then it was a ticker tape parade and welcome. And so he couldn't talk about what he experienced. He literally stuffed it. Would not talk to friends about it, family about it, no one. Several years later when he was passing away, he began to talk about it, and he was eating him, and it had eaten him all these years, but he never had a chance to present it. This unfortunately was before we had such programs as We Honor Veterans. And so there wasn't a veteran volunteer to walk through this experience with him. And so he did get to tell his story, but how different, how much more beneficial could it have been had there been a volunteer veteran with him. I'll also tell you about Bill. Bill was in Vietnam, and like many of that era, not by his choice. When he came home already resenting having given up part of his life, having done things he wouldn't have done otherwise, he stepped off the plane uh, at SeaTac in Seattle, 
first thing he wanted to do on American soil was just stop at the bar and have a drink. Three times the bartender walked by him. Didn't even see him. Turns out he did see him. He wouldn't serve him because he'd been in Vietnam. And this was his welcome home. So people who have served do not always have the best experiences. They can put aside. Now those veterans who have done amazing things, wonderful things, they helped people in ways they couldn't imagine through their life in the military. But still they had nowhere to go with this. Nothing, no place to really share the stories. They had American Legion, VFW, but to take that and share it from a personal standpoint may not have been what they chose to do. So they live with these stories that can take on a whole new meaning as they age, as illness takes over. And one of the biggest hurdles can be stoicism. Somebody goes into the military by choice or by draft. They're young, impressionable, molded into a soldier. And they're taught to be stoic and strong and brave. And that saves their life how many times over in the military experience. It saves the life of their comrades over and over. But when they come home, that stoicism affects them years later when it comes their time to be dying. It's that same stoicism that says, I don't need pain medication, I don't need help. And we see people, former veter veterans, suffer over and over because that stoicism is locked inside them. It's drilled into who they are. One of the reasons that we really have found that veterans serving as volunteers for other veterans can help that. You speak the same language. You understand a culture of the military. And it doesn't really even matter sometimes in the end when you served, what your role was, what your rank was. There is enough commonality. Obviously, it's best to match somebody who's been in similar experience, maybe similar rank, similar parts of the world, similar military experience, but that's not the same as having someone who's not had military experience at all. There's a lot of ways that that partnership, that storytelling, that listening starts off just because with a shared background, We've almost had a conversation before you even meet. And then veterans who volunteer for other veterans helps them too. It's not just altruistic. People go into hospice volunteering with a very altruistic attitude and it's wonderful. But the volunteer ends up pulling so much out of that themselves realizing the value of their own stories, realizing the value of hearing someone else's and sharing theirs, the value of other pieces of that story. So it is a gift all around. And to become a volunteer veteran, uh, there's a, it's a simple application process. The person will go through the same background and train, background check and training that we do for all of our hospice volunteers, but there'd be a special attention to the training of what would happen for military experience. In particular, we found that there's three responses to a war trauma. There's the integrated response to trauma. That's when someone's been through a military experience and they've seen trauma but they've healed with it. They've been able to know that this is the experience that needed to happen. And people say, I'm okay with it. I've got it. I can do this. And it's done. And these are the people who tend to come to the end of their life and they're actually very accepting of what is happening because they have seen so many others go younger, 
and in more pain and with more, more concerns who didn't get a full life. So they're actually adjusting easier to the end of their own life. There's the incomplete integration. And this is where PTSD has dominated someone's life. Thank you. This is far more involved. This is specially trained counselors who would work with people in this situation. What we tend to see is what they would call apparent integration. It seems that people have come home and put away what they needed to put away. But like in, in the stories that I mentioned before about Ed and Bill, they did. They put that away. And towards the end of their life, it all comes up to the surface and bubbles. The trauma that has been packed up in their mind is literally opening the box, taking it out, unpacking it. And they need the experience of talking about it, talking about it with someone who really gets it. So that those lingering effects of the trauma, of those experiences, that can be made peaceful. So they can have a comfortable, more peaceful passing. This gets described in the Veterans History Project in this way. They say the outcome of any armed conflict holds not just the promise of peace, but also dark, terrible revelations, questions of justice vanquished, and for far too many, the confronting personal loss. There's a lot to think about with that. We think that there are, right now, 26 million U.S. veterans alive. 25% of all deaths, that's a veteran. And think about it in more human terms, one out of four deaths every single day is a veteran, is someone who has served this country, someone who deserves that extra care and attention and guidance from others, other veterans at the end of their life. So there's 1,800 veterans who pass away every day. And out of that, those who are involved in the VA system is a minority. 96%, 96% of the veterans who die each day are in the community. They're not even in the VA system. So they may not even realize benefits that they're entitled to. When someone first comes on to hospice, we have what we call a military history checklist. And we find out, did someone serve? Did their spouse serve? Do they have family serving? What was their experience like? And out of that, we can prepare for these kinds of needs. And we have learned, almost from the beginning, never to ask someone, are you a veteran? Sound like a simple yes or no question. Part of the culture in this, veterans self-identify, we have to learn this, veterans self-identify in different ways. We could ask somebody, are you a veteran? And they would say no. If we ask, did you serve in the military? They would say yes. Some veterans self-identify. They didn't serve in a war. They served during peacetime. They served during the Cold War. They don't consider themselves a veteran. If they serve stateside doing a civil job, they don't see themselves as having served. Or they won't call themselves a veteran if they're not enrolled in the VA. And yet to get any of the benefits, someone would need to be enrolled in the VA. And that's something we're help, we can help people do. Get enrolled, get the programs you're entitled to, get the benefits you're entitled to. So that was even a simple question to learn. You can't ask, are you a veteran? Did you serve in the military? And when the answer is yes, that's followed by a huge thank you. Waiting to see if there's any questions.
So I'm going to go back to the stoicism for a second because that is such a core issue. Stoicism and the societal reactions that can come with it, that can discourage veterans from sharing that war experience. They don't feel that there's a safe personal environment for that. And, and veterans who serve as volunteers might also later experience that for themselves. So having this time to come together and creating that safe space for each other, they both benefit. Stoicism and secrecy can dissolve. That's when it's safe to use phrases like, it's only normal that you feel this way right now. Other veterans say they felt like this. The camaraderie that comes out of those statements is that common language, a code of conduct and honor. It's its own culture. So if someone's thinking about being a volunteer, someone who's been a veteran, or maybe you've been in a military family, maybe your sibling has served, but you haven't. Maybe the spouse of someone who served. You're still someone who's really entrenched in that culture. So what happens? at a veteran volunteer patient visit. Well, assistant telling someone, they're helping them tell their stories to reminisce. You know, not just maybe their relatory story, but how did they get there? What did they do afterwards? It's not just the military story, but you'd have a way of grasping what that story really is. And you can really listen, because as a veteran yourself, you know what you are listening for. Maybe there's a way to record. The, they have memory scrapbooks and audio. Different ways to record someone's story if they would like that to get through their family. Produce a memory book, a CD, DVD. Uh, the Veterans History Project collects all these different experiences and stories. Maybe that's something to work on together. So to become a volunteer, we have a volunteer coordinator in our office. And I've got applications and information for people tonight if they wanted to think it over, just to be able to have the experience of talking to someone about what it'd be like to go through the training. It's an application and a background conversation, a few hours of training to experience it all. What's it like to be with someone who's a hospice patient? What is that experience like for them? Then, on top of that training, is the training to be with a veteran. I want to share with you something that Deb Grassman, who has done a tremendous amount of work for veterans, has written to help anyone who's thought about this make that decision and find within themselves the strength to support another veteran. She writes, may each of us here have the grit, the grace, the humility, the love to heal our war-ravaged soldiers and our broken nation. May we be the link that connects the circle so they feel connected to humanity once again. May we not miss the opportunity to help these veteran souls from Iraq, Desert Storm, Vietnam, Korea, Nazi Germany, and other various parts of the world where they served so they can have peace at last. May we help them know that the circle goes on, joining them to you and to me, our people, our nation, our God would be forever grateful.